This is Gliza for Classical Adventures for One, where I read classical work dramatically and discuss things about that work that I find interesting and want to share with my listeners. If that's something that you're into, stick around and let's talk about fictional books of the past. Today's dramatic reading finally introduced me to the Queen of Hearts, and she's actually a lot less scary than I thought she would be. I've always had this unexplained fear of her, and I remember when I was really young, her character was the reason why I didn't pick up the books or even watch any of the movies. She just straight up scared me because I thought that she would really end up beheading poor little Alice. But... Finally reading this book, it made me realize that the queen is pretty harmless. And I do believe that she's hilarious and that her people love her. And she's just a silly, prickly little monarch. So if you missed my reading of it, definitely click on the link found in the description below if you haven't met her yet. Today's artworks are by the talented Wizar, who is based in Brazil. I found his artwork very dark and serious and creepy but in like the best way possible. I've linked his art station below, and if you do end up checking him out, you'd understand why I found his work very creepy and wonderful. I think he did an amazing job in capturing both our character Alice and Charles Lutton Dodson. Seriously, check his art out, you guys. You won't be disappointed. Honestly, it's so hard to choose a favorite writer, but if I had to choose one, it would have to be Sir Terry Pratchett. The day he passed away was such a giant loss to the literature world, and I know eventually his books are going to reach classic level status. He is a prolific writer with many, 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 many works under his belt, and he is one of the very few writers I trust. You may ask me, Liza, what do you mean by that? Why is he the only author you trust? Well, gentle listeners, I'm going to tell you. I trust him in a sense that I know every time I pick his book, I will be happy. No matter what genre he chooses, no matter what the story is about, if I pick up a Terry Pratchett book, I know I'm in for a great ride. Is there a writer that you trust implicitly? Maybe it's Stephen King, or maybe it's Neil Gaiman. That is Sir Terry Pratchett to me. That's the goal of every writer, though, I think. To not just be known for one thing, And though Charles is definitely known mostly just for the Alice books, these are not his only works. And in today's discussion, I want to talk about some of his lesser known works. At least lesser known to me because I've only ever really known the contents of the Alice books until I started this podcast. Charles has always enjoyed writing and entertaining people around him with poems and short stories. And he even submitted them to magazines like Mismash, where, according to Wikipedia, it enjoyed moderate success. A lot of his works definitely leaned toward the more humorous and sometimes satirical in nature, which I can definitely see in the Alice works myself. His puns and wordplay is amazing. It was in March 1856 that he published his first work under Lewis Carroll, the name that would make him legendary. It's where he praises the ability of quietness to soothe his restless soul, and it is in a poem entitled Solitude. Less than 10 years later, he would publish Alice in Wonderland, and six years later after that, Through the Looking Glass. Today, though, we're going to take time away from Alice, and instead focus on two works that did not enjoy the same popularity as the Alice books. First, I want to talk about The Hunting of the Snark, which was published in 1876. The Hunting of the Snark is a long poem about the exploring adventures of a bizarre crew of nine people and one beaver, who set off to find a dangerous creature known as a snark. When I say bizarre, I really mean bizarre. There's nine of them, right? 
The bellman, which is their leader, who used a blank sheet of paper as his map of the ocean to cross the sea and obviously had no idea about crossing the ocean. My favorite line about him is this. This was charming, no doubt, but they shortly found out that the captain they trusted so well had only one notion for crossing the ocean, and that was to tingle his bell. <laughs> they also have boots, and that's pretty much all we know about him. Does he make boots? Does he wear boots? Because there is someone who makes bonnets and hoods, and again, that's all we know of that guy as well. There's a billiard marker who is very skilled. I assume at billiards or marking them. Not really sure how that's needed in a hunting trip. Then there's the barrister who settles any arguments that occurs among the crew. And he also dreams this weird dream about a pig and the snark being the defense lawyer, but also apparently taking over the judge and the jury's role as well. Honestly, the dream itself is pretty weird, just as bizarre as this whole poem itself. I promise you, you won't see the twist of the dream. There's also a broker who values the goods, while also having a banker who is hired at great expense to hold on to their money. Unfortunately, he does end up losing his mind when he meets a bandersnatch who does not appreciate money as much as the banker does, apparently. We also have the butcher and the beaver. When they first mention the butcher, they have been sailing already for a week when the butcher clarifies that yes, he does kill things. And by things, he means just beavers. Of course, as the only beaver in the crew, the beaver was not too pleased to hear that. This beaver was a tame beaver who only liked to make lace in a bow and apparently have saved the crew from multiple potential wrecks. But no one really knows how that has occurred. In the end though, spoilers, they become really good friends and are inseparable by the end of the story. Finally, there's the baker who, by the way, a lot of people assume was written so that Charles can poke fun at his tendency to be forgetful. Because in the story, he forgot all of his things prior to the trip. 42 suitcases worth of things, as well as his own name. Also, this isn't the first time he's played around with the forgetful name situation, as there was a scene in Through the Looking Glass book where Alice herself forgot her own name. So what exactly is the snark that they are hunting? Well, according to the bellman, you can tell that something is a snark by the way they taste. And here he uses words that do not describe food at all. Snarks also wake up late and eat breakfast at 5 p.m. and dinner in the morning. Snarks also have no sense of humor because it always looks deeply distressed and does not appreciate puns. It also likes bathing machines, devices that allow people to change out of their clothes into swimwear and then go swimming at beaches. Finally, snarks are ambitious, and sometimes they are bajoons, which apparently are the dangerous kinds of snarks. According to the poem, if your snark be a bajoon, you will softly and suddenly vanish away and never be met with again. There are two suggestions in regards to how the story came about. According to a biographer, Morton N. Cohen, it was because Charles was taking care of his godson who was sick with tuberculosis. It was after just a couple of hours of sleep wherein Charles had come up with the last line of the poem. For the snark was a bajoom, you see. The other suggestion was by Fuller Tory and Judy Miller, that it was due to the sudden death of Charles's uncle, who worked in a lunatic asylum and was killed by a patient there. They both mentioned the baker's uncle's advice to seek the snark with thimbles, forks, soap, and according to them, these were all items inspected during visits. Henry Holiday was the artist that Charles commissioned for this poem, and their relationship was completely professional and not as controversial, I don't think, as Charles' relationship with Sir John Tenniel. I believe the only disagreements they had was about the personification of hope and care when they were looking for the snark, whether the bujum needed to be illustrated, as well as Charles having him redo his initial portrayal of the broker as Charles was afraid the broker might be perceived as anti-Semitic. There are many people who question Charles about what the poem really means, and for the most part, Charles just said it was nonsense and denied it had any meaning. Though he did finally relent and agreed with one meaning, that it was about the pursuit of happiness. 
Now, I wish I could talk more about this poem, but there just isn't time. I do like the fact that it appeared in the world of the Jabberwocky. So, even though it's a wholly different story from the Alice books, they're still connected somehow. Like their own little MCU, but Alice Universe instead. Which, to segue into our next part of the discussion, The Hunting of the Snark was actually meant to just be entitled as The Bojum, and it was meant to appear in his fantasy novel, Sylvie and Bruno. However, he decided in the end to just publish it earlier as his novel wasn't finished yet. Now, let's talk about Sylvie and Bruno and Sylvie and Bruno concluded. These two books are a little different. They were written 30 years after the Alice's books and definitely not as well received as his previous works. The books still play with two different worlds, the real world and the fantastical world, just like the Alice books. But honestly, that might be the only thing that's similar between the two, except maybe the presence of poems, I suppose. A short summary is that Sylvia and Bruno in the fairy world is attempting to stop a coup against their father, whilst the narrator, who it seems can travel in both worlds because of a heart condition, is living in the real world, where he sees a love triangle formed between his lady friend and two other men. But they mostly talked about criticisms of the Victorian world at that time. The religious views, the politics, etc. Oh, and there's an alien at the end. A lot of goodwill that Charles received from the Alice books seem to have been used up with this series. One of the complaints that can be seen is how jarring it can be to move from one world to another without warning. There is very little sense or reason to it. Though, Marie Ness says in How to Not Write for Both Children and Adults, Sylvie and Bruno, that it could be meant to convey the thin line between reality and dream and to accept the narrator's confusion, since he himself is not at all sure what is going on. In practice, it comes across as muddled and annoying, mostly because the tones of the two narratives are so completely different. Basically, the fairy world is aimed at the children that might have picked up the book, whilst the criticisms of the Victorian era was meant for the adult that was reading it. It went too high for the children and too low for the adults, to the point that it probably didn't appeal to either one who was reading it. Honestly though, if you can get through it, maybe it's my bias but any book that suddenly has an alien in it, and believe me, that twist is worth it for me, it can't be all that bad, right? Marie again probably disagrees with me and says that because of the Sylvie and Bruno books, many authors stopped attempting to write books that were meant for children and adults. There were also less half fairyland and half real world attempts by other authors. Finally, because of this, very few authors experimented with elderly people traveling to magical lands. Which, this really bums me out because I really like the idea of the elderly as superheroes. I once had a D&D character that was this really cool grandma that became like a mafia godmother of Waterdeep. It was the best. As for the illustration, it was Harry Furness that illustrated this book. And it looks like Charles didn't really get along with him either. It was said that Charles was just so controlling over Harry that sometimes the artist would just pretend that he wasn't at home whenever Charles would come to visit. Henry definitely vowed to never work for Charles ever again after he finished the Sylvie and Bruno books. Anyway, as I end this discussion, I want to leave you with Marie's words. This might not have been the legacy Carol wanted for these books, which he hoped and thought would be masterpieces. But sometimes, even a negative legacy can be a legacy. By creating two masterpieces set in fairylands, and two distinctly not masterpieces set in both fairylands and the real world, Carol set a pattern many others would follow. Definitely thank you guys for joining me on this adventure, and if you're listening to this on YouTube, please remember to subscribe, like, and share if you found this episode interesting. I would love to hear from you, so please leave a comment below if you have anything that you want me to know or tips to improve on. If you're listening to it anywhere else, please subscribe, like, and share it to people you think might like it anyway. And you can also email me at classicalgliza at gmail.com. Again, I'm Gliza, and this has been Classical Adventures for One. See you on the next adventure!